So welcome everybody to today's info to go webinar. My name is Annie Gaines. I'm the continuing education consultant at the Idaho Commission for Libraries. Um, this webinar is also sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And today it is my absolute pleasure to turn this over to our very own Dylan Baker and William Lamb, who will be talking all about the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Annie. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides here for everybody before I forget to do that. And hopefully everybody is seeing the slides. Good. Okay. So uh, I would like to go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves here. Uh, we are with the Idaho Commission for Libraries, the state library agency for Idaho. Um, and we will be talking about the uh, Emergency Connectivity Fund, uh, otherwise more affectionately known as ECF. Um, and this has some funding for mobile hotspots and devices for public libraries and schools. We'll be focusing on the public library element, but of course, anything we say here also applies to schools. Um, so before we get too far into, I would like to say, uh, feel free to use the chat function here in Zoom uh, to uh, pop up a chat window and ask any questions you want. You can do that during our presentation or at the end, whatever works easier for you. Um, there is, it'll default to just go to panelists, which we'll see, which is fine. But if you want others to be able to see your question too, maybe comment on it, add to it, um, you might wanna change that default to panelists and attendees. So, all right, without further ado, I am Dylan Baker. Um, I am the e-services program supervisor here at the Commission for Libraries. I head up the e-services team, which is uh, our, our group of folks that uh, kind of support the libraries, uh, Commission for Libraries, both internally, our staff, and libraries throughout the state with technology. Um, one of the members of our e-services team here with me is William. William, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Um, so my name is William Lamb. I'm the technology consultant here at the commission. I've uh, been here for about six months, but prior to that, I was director in Mountain Home and have been in the IT field for 20 years. Excellent. So yeah, you'll get William and I will be kind of tag teaming throughout. Uh, again, if you have questions at any time, just feel free to jump in. And I want to give a major kudos here. I have credit her on the slides, but uh, these are, we heavily adapted uh, Lori German's slides from, uh, she's the Ohio State E-Rate coordinator. She did a similar webinar last week. And uh, I, we really, I liked her slides a lot and asked her if we could use them. And she said, yeah, that would be fine. So anyway, uh, I would like to definitely appreciate uh, her, the use of her slides here. We've definitely tweaked them a little bit for us. And the other caveat I would like to add real quick is because I know we have folks from outside of Idaho. We'll be talking about the Emergency Connectivity Fund in general, which again is available throughout the US, uh, but our specific state knowledge pertains just to Idaho. So if you have differing state laws, which you probably do, you may wanna check uh, when we reference stuff that's specific to Idaho, we'll try to call that out. All right, I think I'm going to pass it over to you, William, to tell us a little bit more about Perfect. the Connectivity Thanks. Fund. So the, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, or ECF, as we're going to allude to here in this presentation a lot, is a $7.17 billion fund that was passed by Congress um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's dedicated to helping schools and libraries bridge the homework gap that everybody has, has seen over the last 18 months um, has been a major problem. Um, these funds are dedicated for emergency off-campus connectivity and will pay for eligible internet connections, tablets, and laptops. Um, to establish this program, the FCC was given 60 days to create the rules and regulations regarding how the program will work. That's a very short time frame, um, which has included some stuff that um, not everybody wanted to see, but we will talk about here later on. Um, the funds are being administered by USAC, which is the E-rate administrator as well. So if you qualify for E-rate already, you automatically qualify for the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Um, a 45-day application period will open later this month and will be for purchases between July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Perfect. Yeah, this was pretty fast moving, uh, as William alluded, you know, just announced in March here in June, and it's already getting open, ready to open later this month. Um, so we're going to really delve into some of the specifics with the program. It's not open yet, as William alluded, it's the application window we expect to open later in June. Um, we kind of hoped by sending this webinar for June 14th, mid-June, we'd have a little more info about that, but we 
don't at this point other than sometime later this month. But we have some good other specifics. Um, we're going to talk. This is what we know as of Monday, June 14th at 1230 Mountain Time. Um, things have been continuing to evolve over the past few weeks. It's pretty rapidly evolving. Um, and we will certainly be putting that information out if there are changes afterwards. But just really want to let people know that it is it is quickly, it has been moving along. And this is what we know at the time. Um, so first, before we really delve into the very specifics, I mean, we're going to give you kind of a high level, the big picture view, I think, of the good and the not so good about this program. Um, and then we're really going to delve into the details on that. So um, let's focus on the good news first. So the good news with this program is it does provide 100% discounts. It's 100% of the funding um, for uh, the eligible equipment, uh, mobile hotspots and laptops, tablets modems. Um, so that that's great. Normally, when we think of E-rate, if you've done E-rate before, you have a discount that could vary from anywhere from 50 to 90%, uh, but uh, you're going to be on the hook for the other part. Um, and, you know, with with the exception of uh, some other uh, additional funding that we have here in Idaho, for the state broadband reimbursement for internet, uh, but you're going to be otherwise on the hook for stuff. Not with the emergency connectivity fund. You're you're getting 100% uh, of the discount, so that's going to fully cover the cost of the device. Again, with some caveats, we'll get to later, but that's that's a pretty great deal. Um, it's a familiar process. If you've done it before? Forms are very similar to the E-rate forms. Um, they're reusing it. That's how they were able to deploy it so quickly. Um, so that that makes it nice. Um, there's also no form 470 bidding process. If you're familiar with E-rate, normally you have to go through a bidding process, wait, receive those bids, evaluate those bids. And that's not a problem here. So you don't have to worry about that. And then the other thing is once the pandemic emergency ends, once that's declared over, um, the library can use any of this equipment they purchased through ECF for educational purposes the library considers appropriate. So it's not like you have to turn it back or um, dispose of it. You can keep using of it um, outside of the ECF window. However, uh, here are some of the things you need to think about, and we're going to get more into the details of the, the not so good are, are some of the things that are real like mm, barriers or obstacles to using this program. Um, first, and it's a doozy, the big one is that there are some requirements that may infringe upon patron privacy, um, and we'll get more specifically into those, but um, the two biggies are that the patrons need to sign a statement of need um, when they're checking out some equipment that was provided through ECF funds. So you need to actually have the patron sign that they needed this equipment. And we'll get a little more into that later. Um, the other thing is keeping an inventory with the borrower's full name uh, in record um, along with, with the stuff for this program. They, that, that is one of the expectations. So that's some pretty, you know, if we talk about our library values and protecting uh, patron privacy, you know, and think about our um, library catalog systems, you know, we're not typically you don't want to hold on to that kind of stuff very long. So this might require a little different thinking. Again, we'll get more into that later in the presentation, but those are two biggies right from the start. Um, along with those uh, uh, inventories and statements of need, holding on to records for 10 years after the end of the program. So very much like E-rate, you got to hold on to stuff. Um, keep that in your mindset. A um, little different here, though, of course, in the sense that E-rate's just asking you for anything pertaining to E-rate. If you participate in the Emergency Connectivity Fund, you're thinking of all these other things that you're required to hold on to, the patron state of need, the inventory. It can be a lot of documents to hold on to. Um, there's a short window to prepare and file. I think is uh, we'll get into that too. Once this program opens up, it's going to be a very narrow window of, uh, to time to apply. Um, so that's why it's great you're already here thinking about it before the window opens because there's some steps you'll want to do ahead of time. Um, and then finally, the the funding. Uh, for ongoing costs right now is only going to cover through June 30th, 2022. So if you want to get some hotspots and you get a bunch of them, the Emergency Connectivity Fund will cover you up through June 30th of 2022, but then you're going to be on the hook for after that. I mean, there might be some money left. We'll see. You, know, you could potentially uh, still fund that later, but it's it's best not to count on it. Um, and I see Jessica, you had a great question in the chat. Does it cover desktop PCs? We'll get more sp into the specifics of what it covers here in just a moment, but Spoiler alert, no, you cannot use it for desktop PCs. Um, William, anything else with the big picture that I missed on that? No, I don't I don't think so. I think you covered okay. everything of, um, you know, there's there's really good portions of this. And then there's also some stuff that, you know, may be a concern to, to people that, like you said, they'll have to think outside the box of how this could apply and, and work within their own internal libraries. 
perfect, thank you. And William, would you like to uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the differences between what ECF and some of these other programs? Sure, thanks. Um, so everybody, as everybody probably is already aware, the traditional E-rate program provides discounts of 20 to 90% off of category one um, internet connectivity. Um, this provides internet on and Wi-Fi on campuses or library sites only, um, which includes bookmobiles for, especially in the state of Idaho. Whereas ECF will provide 100% of costs for off-campus, off-premise um, internet and connected devices um, to be used by students or library patrons. Um, additionally, there's also the emergency broadband benefit EBB that Dylan mentioned earlier um, that we did a webinar on last week. It provides discounted services for low income households um, and is part of a $3.2 billion program um, that is specific for those eligible low income households. So households must apply directly for that program, um, but libraries are encouraged to assist them if they need it. Excellent. And William, you mentioned something about off campus. Can you tell us what, where this is eligible? Absolutely. Um, so eligible locations and services include anywhere that remote access is needed for learning, um, specifically the home community centers, homeless shelters, um, or if you have additional library bookmobiles or vehicles that are not being used is in part of the actual E-rate program, you could fund to provide wireless access outside of those um, units as well. Keep in mind that if you already get the the E rate support you, as a library branch, it's not eligible for this. Um, and this program is geared towards existing commercial internet providers. So if there is no commercial internet service in your communities at all right now, you do have the ability to request funding to build out your own network to those patrons or students. Just keep in mind that um, this funding is for a year and it may not be possible with limitations on fiber and connectivity and stuff right now to actually build that out within a year. Um, some ineligible services include if it's going to your actual library, uh, you cannot pay to you know run fiber to your library directly with this program that would be covered under E-rate. Um. Yeah, thanks, William. That's uh, it's it's really good to know that you know a lot of I've had a, a few questions from libraries already, and many were asking could they use this to purchase laptops for use in the library, and it's just not going to work under ECF. It really has to be the device has to be intended for use outside of the library. So definitely something folks need to keep in mind with this. Um, talking about eligible services, we kind of already talked about desktop computers, but here's um, some of the things that are are eligible uh, for. ECF, um, broadband service, um, we're talking either mobile hotspots, which I think is gonna be the most common. Um, there also is the ability for a library or school to pay for a fixed connection. So like a cable internet or DSL connection to someone's home. I haven't really heard a lot of libraries wanting to go down that path. That seems pretty complicated to pay for a residential fixed service um, for a library patron. Um, that may be something schools maybe look into more, but for public libraries, I think we're looking more at the mobile hotspots. Um, you can get up to um, one hotspot per, per user. Um, it will cover monthly reoccurring uh, service costs, and there's no minimum standard for the speed of the service or anything like that. Um, so you could be looking at quite a few different options. Um, the thing to note, there are some caps. So when I said 100% funding, uh, that is true with the big asterisk. And, and the, the, the catch is that for Wi-Fi hotspots, there is a cap of $250 per device, um, which I think will cover most of the Wi-Fi hotspots you're thinking. Um, again, smartphones are not eligible. Even if the smartphone could serve as a hotspot, that's not gonna be eligible. They don't, they don't want to fund sp smartphones with this. Um, so looking at most hot, hotspot devices probably would work. Um, there's no cap on modems or routers if you were gonna go that route of getting an actual modem or router. Um, and then laptops and tablets, I think this is the biggie is, Laptops and tablets are going to be capped up at uh, $400 per device. So you're thinking Chromebooks, maybe really inexpensive Windows laptops, um, Android tablets, uh, older iPads, those probably will all fall under. Um, but if you're looking at things like nicer Windows laptops, um, certainly any kind of Apple laptop um, or newer iPads, you're probably going to 
go past that $400 limit, and then you're going to be on the hook for some of those. Um, and there is no allowance for breakage or spares. You really want to kind of do a needs assessment to figure out how many devices are my community members going to actually need and that would be willing to go through the process of, you know, saying, I need this stuff. I will sign a statement at the library saying I, I actually need it. So just some things to keep in mind in terms of what kind of devices. Again, it's a, it's a more limited scope in, in a lot of ways, but there are things we've never had access to in E-Rate before because um, this is a different program, things like the laptops and tablets. Um, so there's definitely some things you can think about there. Um, and uh, let me uh, pass it over to William to talk about like, so now we know what the devices are, what about the timeline for all of this? Yeah, thanks. So right now the anticipated window will open sometime in late June. Um, we do not have a final timeline yet, um, but that is what the FCC and USAC is, is publishing out that late June. It'll be a 45 day window to um, submit your applications as Dylan alluded to earlier. It's a really tight window to figure out what your needs are, figure out if this program will work for you, and then decide how many you're gonna try to apply for under this program. If funds remain after the, this first window, they, they will open a second one. It has not been determined yet whether it will be for additional new purchases from let's say July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023 yet, or if it'll be retroactive March 1st through June 30th, 2021. Um, right now, the kind of the, the thought process is, is they may make it retroactive to help because of the pandemic and that's what these funds are for, um, but we won't know until after it's determined how much funds are left under this first round. And then this process will continue, you know, until all funds are depleted of that $7 billion. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, these funds are administered by USAC, which is the rate administrator as well. So they'll be utilizing all the existing forms as much as they can and tweaking them as necessary specific to ECF. Um, they'll use the forms like the 471 and the BEAR. Um, not, I know a lot, a lot of libraries in Idaho use the bear, but it might be the easier option in the future. And they're also eliminating the pin number requirement for bear, which will make this process a lot easier for all libraries. Um, they'll also be adding new certifications that will um, determine whether that you're not using duplicate funds to pay for this stuff. So you, you're not requesting stuff under ECF, but you've already received it under some prior CARES Act funding or E-rate funding. So you'll have to certify that. Additionally, as Dylan alluded to earlier, there's no form 470 required. There's no competitive bidding um, requirements like there is with regular E-rate. The only thing that is required is you must follow your state and local procurement rules. So if your city has a rule that says, you, you know, you have to go out for bid over $2,500 and your stuff is over $2,500, you have to do that. Excellent. And uh, let's talk about how you can actually get the funding. And uh, Jill, I saw your question here in the chat of, does that cap, um, include monthly service costs? No. Uh, so there is no cap. They are expecting reasonable amounts. Um, and uh, I think in my experience, so what they've said in the order uh, is, you know, they expect monthly co costs of maybe 15 to $25 a month, which I think is really optimistic from what I've seen a lot of. I think I would say a more realistic cost in a lot of cases might be more in the $40 a month range, um, plus or minus. Um, and they, but they haven't set caps. And as long as it's reasonable, I mean, I think if you're asking a, if a service provider is saying that the monthly service cost is like $200 a month, they might have some questions about that not being reasonable. Um, but otherwise, there is no cap on the actual monthly service cost. And speaking of funding, um, so how, how this is going to be determined, again, William said we had the $7.2 billion, and this is the first of, first of potentially more application windows if funding is left. Well, how are we going to determine if maybe uh, that funding is going to get out there? Uh, first, uh, no funding decisions are made until after the filing window closes. I think that's a big reason why we're only seeing a 45-day application window once it opens, is they don't want to make they got to get all those applications in before they make any decisions on how much they're going to actually be able to fund. So um, once you get in, you won't actually know if you're funded or not until after those 45 days have passed. Um, they're, they're really aiming high here, I think, in a lot of ways to get 50% of all applicate, workable applications funded within 60 days and then 70% within 100 days. So hopefully you're not going to be waiting a long time. Again, the, with the narrow window on this time frame, you really want to make sure things get funded. Um, but here's some of the rub I think we talked about uh, 
I don't even know if we put this in the not so good, but it's definitely something I've been letting libraries know um, is this funding priority because 7.2 billion seems like a lot of money. Uh, I mean, honestly, it is a lot of money, but when we're talking about a whole uh, US wide uh, program that includes schools and libraries, um, it's really a tough guess to say how, how fast that money's gonna go. So they've already put in place a plan for what if they get more applications in this first window uh, than a funding, if they get more than 7.2 billion worth, which could possibly happen again with a 100%, uh, they're cover, covering 100% of the costs. Um, it's, it's really hard to say. So how they've prioritized what they're gonna fund is based on a library's E-rate discount rate or school's library, e -rate, our school's E-rate discount rate. Um, so uh, for uh, category one, which is internet services, every school or library has a discount rate of anywhere from 50 to 90%. And then um, a library or school will be classified as urban or rural. So I'm gonna go to the next slide here to kind of try and illustrate this. Um, so let me try and explain how this funding priority works. And it goes a little reverse from what you'd expect in the sense that the top priority, what's gonna get definitely funded first is what's in the bottom right of this table. So those that are um, rural and have a discount rate of 90%, which then gets bumped up by 5% for this program to be considered 95%. Again, you're always receiving 100% discounts. So they're not actually using that to determine the cost off, it's just determined how what what ranking you are in terms of being funded. Um, so, and that on the left side of the table, that's for schools, it's determined that percentage, that discount level is determined by the students eligible for the National School Lunch Program. That's not something libraries have to determine. They just look at the school district that your library is associated with. Um, and I should have said earlier, the caveat is you can participate in the Emergency Connectivity Fund without being in the E-rate program. Um, so if you have never participated in E-rate before, that's fine. You can totally just participate in, in ECF, um, but then you might not know what your discount level is. And in that case, um, just contact William or I uh, anytime and we'll, we'll try to help you determine that basically just probably by looking at what your associated school district is. Um, we should be able to get a pretty good idea of that. So as you can see, if you're a library or school that's currently receiving a 90% discount, um, and uh, you have a rural designation, you are going to get funded. I don't. I, I. I would be shocked if there were so many applications from libraries that were and schools that were in the ninety percent rural that they had to prioritize just for that group. So I would say you're pretty confident applying. Now, if you're a library or school, as you work your way down the table, that maybe has a let's say sixty percent discount level. Um, and you are uh, urban, you're, as you can see, the, that red number six next to you means there are five other groups ahead of you that will get funding before you will. So then it's a little bit more of like, okay, maybe I'll get it. Um, all the way down to um, some of the schools and libraries, you know, I think the lowest I've seen in, in our area is about a 50% um, and urban. So, you know, you could be down ranked number eight in terms of getting funding. So that's definitely something you want to consider. Um, and Shelly, to answer your question in the chat, this is, this is based on the category one discount rate. I believe that's true. Um, and uh, so anyway, this is just something you got to think about with ECF is what's your current discount level? And if it's less than 90 or 80, you need to maybe consider, um, you may, Potentially, if there's a lot of interest in this program, you may not receive funding. Um, so it's not a guarantee. Um, just so that that's kind of their rank. Hopefully that makes sense. Ask questions on that more later if you want. Um, and again, if you don't know what your current discount level is, you can ask William or I, we can easily look it up for you. Um, so let's assume you're getting the funding. Uh, William, can you tell us maybe how, how we'll get that actual funding? Yeah, thanks. So there's there's two options, just like the the E rate process. There's the bare method where the library will pay 100% of that cost up front, and then request reimbursement from USAC um, after everything has been purchased. So with ECF, you know everything is 100% reversible up to you know the the limited caps they have on some stuff. Um, you may purchase prior to ECF funding decisions, but that is a huge gamble that you're taking, um, especially if you're on the lower end of that that um, percentage discount 
under E-rate, you may not receive funding and then you're on the hook for all of that. Um, they've also built in a mechanism to do pre-reimbursement for libraries that may not have the funds available to, to, to offset everything up front where they can request the funding from USAC before they even make the purchase. And then they have to provide proof afterwards within 30 days that those funds have been paid to the vendor um, that you've selected or provider in the case of mobile hotspots. Uh, the SPY method is usually what most people will use for the regular E-rate stuff where you'll just get a discount on your on your bill. In the case where providers will, will utilize the SPY method with this program, you shouldn't receive a bill that has a cost associated that you have to pay out. The, the provider will automatically handle the invoicing on the back end directly to USAC. In the cases where there, the provider doesn't do SPY, then then your only option is the, the bare method. And just keep in mind that all service providers do not have to participate in the SPY method. For the bare reimbursement, they've shortened the reimbursement time frame from regular E-rate. It is now 60 days for the specific to ECF, whereas with E-rate it's 128 days. Um, you have to provide detailed invoices that are itemized. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit later of, of why. Um, but it has to be more details than just here's the cost and here's the month. It has to provide some additional information as well. And to get bare reimbursements, and this is kind of a newer thing, is registration with the System of Award Management, SAM, um, which is utilizing all federal funds and, and showing how those awards are, are given to um, applicants during this process. And we'll kind of give a detailed overview of how that would look for your library. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good thing to be thinking about there. Um, thinking all the all the steps you might have to do, and certainly looking at the um, spy method. Um, you know, they're not required, unlike unlike the E-rate program, where it's really up to the school or library on what how they get reimbursed. This, it's more up to the service provider. So I encourage folks, especially, to consider talking with a service provider to see if they're willing to what what methods they're willing to support, because um, that may or may not influence what you want to do. Um, all right, now we'll get into some of the bigger, uh, some of the more major requirements here, the things that we could spend some time on. Um, first is the SIPA requirement. Uh, that's the Children's Internet Protection Act. If you're already participating in the E-Ray program, you're probably somewhat familiar with this. If not, um, it is kind of a, a, a provision, a requirement within the E-Ray program and is also here in ECF uh, to uh, provide uh, content filtering um, on um, connections on library or school owned devices um, where the internet connection is funded by E-rate or in this case ECF. Now there's a couple caveats here um, for ECF that we've kind of noted in the slide that I'm gonna try and work through real quick is that, so providing that, that filtering applies to any computer owned by a school or library receiving ECF or E-rate. So um, if you're purchasing a laptop or a tablet through ECF and checking it out and sending it home with someone that needs to comply with SIPA. It needs to be filtered in some way. Um, even if you did not purchase the computer using E-rate or ECF funds, um, but you purchased it some other way, um, if it's owned by the school or library, it does need to comply with, with SIPA. It's a library or school owned device. Um, and the cases though, where it will not apply is if the school or library does not see BCF or ECF rate funding for internet service, only for devices. So if you don't participate in the E-rate program and you only wanna do ECF and you only wanna get tablets and laptops, you would not need to uh, necessarily consider SIPA in that case. So that is something you can consider. Um, and then the final statement here um, with some of that red text is that SIPA does not apply uh, for computers that are owned by the student or, or library patron. Um, so if it's not owned by the library, you don't have to be thinking about uh, ECF. So if you're buying like mobile hotspots with ECF funds and checking them out, those don't necessarily have to be filtered to comply with SIPA. However, for those of you that live in Idaho, um, we do have, there was an uh, addition to Idaho State Code uh, last year that requires public libraries to filter their public wireless. Um, it's not specific about mobile hotspots, but you might wanna consult with your own local legal counsel, but the general safety we've heard is to consider mobile hotspots you check out would fall under that state code to provide filtering 
on uh, just like your public wireless. So in that case, SIPA may not apply, but if you're still checking out mobile hotspots, you're probably still gonna be filtering because of Idaho state code. Um, again, feel free to consult with your local legal counsel because that is not very specific in the state code and it's really can be a little bit up to how a particular legal advice interprets it. So those are the filtering requirements <laughs> all the time, but let's get into the even bigger meteor topic here, um, which we can talk about a little bit, is what is requ the other requirement that we kind of hit in the not so good is this inventory that's required um, to participate in the program. So we're talking specifically about this is equipment that you're going to be purchasing through ECF, whether it's a laptop, tablet, or mobile hotspot that's going to be provided directly to an individual library patron. So this is not like something you're putting on a school bus that multiple folks are using um, or uh, that might get used in a community center or something like that. Um, this is something that you'd be checking out to an individual. For a thing you're checking out to an individual, you need stuff like you need a, a detailed inventory. It's got the device or equipment type, the make and model, the serial number, and then here are the big ones. And we highlighted in red here the real big one. The full name of the person to whom the device or the piece of equipment was provided, and then the dates the device or equipment was loaned out and returned to the library or the date the library was notified that it was missing, lost, or damaged. So let's focus on that one for a minute. Um, again, we'll couple this with the thought that you need to keep records for 10 years. Um, and most library cataloging systems are not gonna hold on to <laughs> the particular patron that checked out your mobile hotspot or laptop for 10 whole years. Um, so you need to be considering how you're gonna hold on to those records. The other thing you're gonna be considering here is the ethics of our library profession and how it is about patron privacy, what, you know, holding on to a person's particular name that was attached to a device they checked out. And um, another thing you might want to consider, uh, and we'll get into that in a minute too, is how state law impacts that. Um, and before I get super into that, let's just talk about the auditing purposes. So um, this is the reason you're holding on to this stuff is you're not submitting it at the time of the application or the time you're doing the reimbursement what this is being held on to for 10 years, that any time in the next 10 years, the FCC or USAC can come back to you and say, we, you, we were told you to hold on to this inventory information. We want it now to prove that you were actually in compliance with the program. Um, so it's not something you're providing immediately. It's really only in an audit case. And they, as of last week, when we kind of were on a call with some of the E-rate officials, they're still working through what the auditing piece is going to look like, but this is based on the best information we have now, is that they could ask for this information um, to hey, produce those that produce that inventory list um, that has the full name and the dates and everything like that. Now, it has been specified in the order. There's a couple of things you can do about this. You can provide um, redacted and anonymized uh, information uh, to those auditors and they, that they understand the need for patron privacy. So if you, you know, aren't comfortable with, and I don't think I would necessarily be comfortable with immediately just handing over a list of here's all the patrons who checked out this stuff, you know, you could provide some redacted information that hid any patron identifying information. Um, you're still gonna have to hold on to it somewhere in your library for 10 years, but what you provide to the FCC and USAC, you know, could have the redacted and then the auditors are going to uh, try to accept that. If for some reason to um, assure program compliance, the redacted information is not enough for them, um, then uh, they may come back to you and ask for it. Uh, they may subpoena you for it. Um, and in that case, you're gonna be looking at, um, at least we're talking about Idaho state law here that you would be needing to get the patron's consent to provide their information, their publicly identifiable information to use the USAC or FCC. And what we've been assured, we've told is that the auditors, if you said, look, I'm not gonna be able to contact a patron 10 years from now, uh, that may just not be possible. So I cannot release their information to you. Um, state law does, does override in, in this case, in the sense that you could say, look, I can only provide you this react information. I can't get a hold of the patron. Here's what we attempted to do. Um, so that's just a thing you need to can kind of consider here is, is um, making your best at best possible effort, both to comply with, with state law here in Idaho, we have a state code that protects patron privacy. So not only do we have the ethics of our profession, patron privacy is protected by state law and really can patron information can only be disclosed with the patron's consent. So um, you're gonna be 
holding on to that redacted information, but if you need to provide more than that, you're, you're going to be contacting the patron for their permission to do that. Um, there's a couple of options for how to go about that. You know, you can, um, we're going to go into the, the thing that you're going to have to have a patron submit a, a uh, use a require a, that they have a need for this device. Part of that required need for the device is that they could also be signing at the same time, you know, that they understand that if you are absolutely required that they consent to have their information handed over. So you can handle it at the kind of time that they check out the device. Um, how do you hold on to the document rent retention and protect patient privacy is since this is only needed on audits, maybe you're putting all this, these signed forms and inventory just go into a locked file that nobody accesses unless FCC and USAC come back to you for an audit. And then you're only ready to produce them at that point. Um, so there's there's a couple thoughts on that. We've we've a lot of this has been filtered through what we've heard other states dealing with, what the American Library Association has been discussing, other groups we're part of, and then some guidance we just received from um, our deputy attorney general about what state law implies and what the order implies. Um, William, do you want to jump in on any of this? I think you covered it very well. Um, yeah, you know, I guess one thing to add and to this is you know that 10-year period is at the end of the the program the funding year so specific to ucf here you'd have to hold on to those documents till june 30th 2032 yes. um you know just like with the e-rate program if you have a five-year contract you technically have to hold all that documentation for 15 years not 10 because it's based on the end of the program so i guess you know that's kind of the hard thing and, and like dylan mentioned if if you have a way that you can secure that stuff for that period and you decide to, to participate in this program, then, you know, it, it's up to each individual library kind of to figure out what works best for them and securing that patron data for that time period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a big consideration. The other thing I would add to this is um, when you're thinking about these not so good, these requirements, this, this might imply for ECF, one of the things I've, I've seen bandied about a lot and suggested is this ECF may not be a natural thing where if you're just going to be like, your library's already checking out hotspots, how can we just add a couple more hotspots? That this might be very difficult to run alongside an existing hotspot program in the terms of the requirements you're going to have to do in terms of having the patron sign a need form and keep an inventory. So something you may want to consider instead is if you're going to do ECF is do like a separate like maybe a longer term lending solution rather than having if you're checking out a hotspot that comes and you're checking them out and they only go out for a week or two, you're gonna be recording a lot of patron names uh, in your inventory um, and having them sign a lot of statements. Whereas if, if you instead looked at something like, well, we've already got these normal hotspots we're checking out. How about for ECF, we, we do a special longer term lending agreement where we're checking something out for us three months at a time. Um, then you're having much less you have to track and then you're having much less patrons that have to sign this kind of form and it may supplement your own uh, existing programs that way. Um, so Shelly, uh, these device services are needs-based, the library responsible in verifying need or is that fall on the paper when they sign the form? Great question. And it's different for schools and libraries. Schools have to go through a different kind of eligibility thing because they have more relationship with their students. For the libraries, we, we are fortunate that it does fall on the patron. You just, the library has to provide that form that the patron signs indicates that I need this. This is the only way I can, I can access the internet is by this program available at the library. But them, the patron signing that form, that solves the problem for the library. The library does not have to do anything beyond that to prove that the patron absolutely needed it. And to add to the um, part about doing a separate program for hotspots, for example, or even hotspots and laptops of doing it for a long term, three months, six months. That's a really good um, option for those that don't want to do the administrative work of maintaining all those records for that amount of time. And then the um, also the, the part about it's only funding for one year. So if you're doing as a separate program and you're not able to continue the funding after one year with your own internal budgets, it's a good option to at least get that stuff out to those patrons that could use it. Absolutely. All right, and uh, William, do you want to tell us about some of the other rules that we maybe hit or haven't hit yet? Sure. Um, so I'm not going to go to the 10 year document retention because we've covered that a lot during this. Um, as mentioned early on, you must certify that it's non duplicated services, no double dipping. These funds cannot 
be requested for something that has already been paid for. Um, that includes stuff, you know, like if the commission has provided a grant for hotspots, you know. However, you can request funding from ECF if like the commission provided funding through June, the end of June for the next year. Um, so that's not considered double dipping. It's it's considered a continuation of, of something you already have and are providing. Um, some providers do offer free hotspots. Um, I think there's one or two of them that are offering free hotspots at no cost to libraries when purchasing their services. This does not violate any gift rules. It's just part of their program of what they offer to any you know library government entity. So there's no there's no concern about violating any gift rules there. And then if for some reason you request funds and it's denied, you have only 30 days to, to appeal that denial. Um, and as we've kind of talked about, any updates that we receive, we'll continue to push out to the library community here in Idaho. Um, and then also Dylan and I are both available for one-on-one -on -one consulting um, specific to ECF or any other program that's available. Yeah. And for the ineligible portions of this, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, this the whole purpose behind this program is to get these these devices and funds out into the communities for for that homework gap and to bridge that divide. Some of the things that you can't use the funds for is administrative costs like personnel expenses for somebody to administer the you know the program or keep track of all the the paperwork required. Um, it can't be used for software licensing, content filtering. Um, if it's not included in the base price of the device, it, it won't be available for like charging stations or even additional power cords uh, for laptops or tablets. You know, if you, for example, if you want purchase laptops and you want charge or laptop bags or tablet cases or extra power cords, that is all on the library to pay for out of their own funds. And then I, Dylan will go into it in a minute, but the, the commission also has some grant opportunities that may help assist with that, so. Absolutely. Um, yes, thank you, William. So next steps, let's think, okay, you're thinking about the wheels are turning, you think you might be able to use ECF, the application window isn't open yet, but there are things you can do to prepare for when that application window opens, and I would highly recommend doing it as soon as possible because that application window is going to be over before you know it with that 45 days that it could it could open any day now um really um so a couple things uh, first determining needs be prepared to explain how the need was determined and that really is just like how many hotspots or laptops are you going to actually want to request through ecf and you need to have at least a way to justify because again it's one device per user that could actually use it and um i think you know, you're going to get in some trouble if, you know, you say, I'm just going to request 10,000 of these. And, you know, realistically, then you're only able to check out 200 or something. So you really need to get kind of just an idea of like, how many of these can I realistically expect to, to um, provide, to make available that folks will want to sign the statement saying they needed it. Um, if you're not already participating in E-Rate, you need to get registered uh, through the USAC for their uh, portal, E-Rate Productivity Center, because everything's going to run through that. Um, again, William and I can help you with any of these steps, but if you want to take it on your own, you can call up the customer service. Um, they'll ask you to get an FCC registration number. There's a process to do that. So again, kind of a, a step to, if you're not participating in E-Rate, if you're already in E-Rate, great. You can check that box. You can move on. Um, if you don't already have a DUNS number, I don't I'm not 100 sure if a DUNS number is specifically required for this program, but it's a good thing to have, and it's certainly going to be needed for other programs the Idaho Commission for Libraries is going to be offering. So definitely consider that. Um, and you can get registered for DUNS number. Again, we can help you with that. There's processes. Um, as, as William alluded before, to get any kind of reimbursement for the program, you're going to be your library will need to be registered with SAM.gov. And it's kind of a multi-step process here. Um, where you have to get a username first with the service login.gov, then you create the user account for SAM.gov, and then you actually register your organization. Um, and it can take upwards of 20 days, I've heard, to get through this whole process. So you could see if you don't start that now-ish, you could be really cutting into your application window um, if, you don't, if you don't have that SAM.gov. And William and I can push out here, there are some great... Um, guides other libraries have put together in terms of how to actually step by step by step go through that whole registration process and it's got screenshots it's it's not super scary it's just a little time consuming um, to, to step through the process and then wait maybe for verification at each of those steps it's not something you can just maybe do in one day and be done um, 
And then also be thinking about providing how what you're going to provide patrons with that, that, that eligible use policy that says that it's only intended for patrons that do not have the internet access sufficient to meet their needs and that they're going to have to sign off on. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to, you know, have some samples available or, or at least point folks to um, possible policies that libraries might consider using um, for, for what that kind of statement would be. Um, so that, you know, you can just start thinking about it. Again, you won't have to have that eligible use policy until you actually receive the funding, receive the devices, then I'm starting to put them out there. But it's not bad to start thinking about how, what kind of internal process would you have in place to do that? And of course, the last and very important step, how are you going to hold on to all this stuff for 10 years? And how are you going to do that in a secure way if, again, we're talking about an inventory that has and signed sheets that have patrons' names and, and other potentially identifying information on them? So all things you want to think about. Um, anything else that folks should think about that we didn't address here, William, you think? I don't think so. I think you covered it all. I think the biggest one is the SAM.gov um, yeah. since it takes a while to get that confirmed and registered. Perfect. Yeah. And you, there's a there's a chance you might already have a SAM.gov account for your library and you can search that too. And we'll have instructions for that. So maybe you'll already set. Yeah, that's just something you have to look up. And on the needs assessment part of, of determining needs for your community, it doesn't have to be complicated, you know, but it just has to show that you've put thought into why you're requesting those devices or hotspots. Yeah. And all right, we are roll it wrapping up we got through most of the big details here just some extra uh contact information and some resources here um got a variety of of links um just uh so there's william and my contact information again contacts anytime anything regarding ecf rate um other technology issues for your library um and then here's a bunch of resources that first one the usac emergency connectivity fund program website and trainings that what just went up this morning. I felt like they they knew we were doing a webinar today and they just pushed the publish button right at the right time. Um, so that one is gonna be fantastic because it's got kind of, they're still building it. Obviously it's not all there yet, but they've got uh, a kind of a step-by-step -step process, a little bit more information about ECF. And the best part is they have some trainings. They're gonna do some more live webinars and they may not be as, well, they might not be as entertaining as ours. I mean, that would be a very tough act to follow, but they will probably, that you will be getting official information directly from USAC for those, those trainings. So they have some coming up later this week and next week. Um, so I really encourage you to go check out that emergencyconnectivityfund.org webpage, look at the trainings page and, and sign up for any of those webinars if you're interested, because that is gonna be the horse's mouth giving us information on, on ECF. These are the first trainings they're making really available. Um, next there, we have uh, our great E-rate and broadband webpage and email list. Um, so William maintains that page and he's got a great email list and that's probably one of the best places we're gonna be pushing out more ECF information. Um, so if you're not already signed up for that mailing list, uh, you'll find it on that webpage. Um, and then the ALA's got a page that they've been putting together, the American Library Association's uh, guide, uh, our information all about the Emergency Connectivity Fund, their concerns from the you know, ethics of our profession um, and some of the other requirements. And then they have these great guides they've been putting together about, you know, uh, one of them is like long-term hotspot lending how to start from beginning to end, you know, thinking about the needs to implementing it in your library, to, you know, keeping the records. Um, so they've got these great multi-page PDF guides they've just been putting up there for a variety of these like kind of scenarios you could use ECF for. Um, so really happy to see those and really encourage people to check out the ALA site. And then finally, one of the E-Ray consultants out there, Funds for Learning, they've done some great webinars in the past about ECF. That's a lot of the information we've pulled from. They've got another FAQ. Um, so they're another, another source of information you want to check. So a lot of places to go check. Again, if you forget any of those, you can come back to William and I, ask us for any of those questions. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't finally put a plug in for, uh, as William alluded, um, if ECF is, if you've looked at it and you're like, oh, there's a lot of obstacles here, or this isn't going to work in the exact way I was hoping it would, I was hoping to get desktops for my library, or I was hoping to, um, you know, get 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 some hotspots and and maybe use them in a slightly different way than ECF wanted me to, please consider the Idaho Commission for Libraries ARPA grants that we have available right now. Now the time is ticking. Tomorrow is the deadline, July uh, 15th. Uh, so you got to get that dead, the deadline in there. But any library entity basically in Idaho is eligible. Uh, there are no minimum, no maximum amounts for these grants. And many of the things you think about, can I do this with ECF? 
is likely probably eligible for what we're thinking about with our ARPA grants um, and then, then some. So things like new desktop, desktops for your library, um, maybe you're looking at uh, software, like software is ineligible for ECF, but maybe there's something that would help you run your library better. Um, so please, please, please think about those ARPA grants if you aren't already, get on it because the deadline is tomorrow. Um, all right. And now Shelly has asked us our first questions because I'm hoping we'll transition here to questions. We have about 10 minutes left scheduled. So uh, Shelly, first question here, is a mobile router like a cradle point eligible for funding? Uh, if, if so, would that mean that anyone who wants to connect to the mobile network to fill out the required form? No, that's a great question. So we didn't focus heavily on it in this webinar, but my understanding of the VCF, and, and I'll let William jump in, is that those community kind of needs um, can be addressed by ECF. So if you have a community center or a school bus or something that's going to be used, or you're going to take it to, uh, I don't know, a farmer's market, um, those are all eligible things as long as they're off the library campus. And uh, we didn't talk heavily about them, but mobile modems and routers, so things like a cradle point uh, would be eligible. Would that agree with what you think too, William? Yeah, I was going to say, as long as it's not in an existing like bookmobile or something that is already eligible for e-rate funding, um, then yeah, it could be placed anywhere that's a community center that could be used for remote learning or access um, and be eligible for ECF. And you don't have to have everybody fill out the form who connects to it, which is kind of awesome. And in your inventory, all you have to list was the library person that was responsible basically for, main, for maintaining it. So um, it really sidesteps some of the more concerning issues if you're going with something that's gonna be providing um, you know, access to several folks rather than just an individual at a time. Um, so definitely a great use of ECF there. Um, other other questions, comments folks have, um, feel please type those in the chat. We will hang out. Um, if you don't have more questions, uh, you obviously do not have to stick around. Um, there will be a, a recording of this made available later this week, thanks to Annie, uh, that you can, Rewatch uh, to your heart's content and share with others. Um, and again, please, 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 if you have any questions, I know this, we covered a lot of info and it's taken William and myself weeks to wrap our minds around this program. And it's still like they're building the plane as they're trying to fly it. Um, so reach out to us anytime if you have questions, like, is this eligible? Or I think you covered this in the webinar, but I wasn't sure. Just for contact us. We, we are happy to try and help you with that. Um, and we'll keep pushing more information out as we have it. So we'll wait another minute or two to see if there are quite many further questions. While we're waiting just a second, I'm going to go pull up the web pages here so folks can see. So this is the USAC one. This is their new emergency connectivity fund. If you go to that not help, sorry, resources. There is a training link that takes you here. If I zoom in a little bit, here are their initial webinars they're making available. Um, they've got one for people who are already participating in E-Rate. That's coming up this Wednesday. They've got one for people who are not participating, haven't participated in E-Rate before. That's coming up on Thursday. Um, they have one for tribal applicants coming up also on Thursday. And then next Wednesday, they're gonna have it for everybody. They're gonna have another webinar. So I think those are gonna be really great. Um, and uh, Stephanie, yes, great question. Could redacting info be as simple as crossing something out with a Sharpie? Uh, after, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. Uh, so you hold onto that record as long as you got, then you can just take out that personal identifying information. So yeah, real, real good, easy solution there. Um, this is the E-rate and broadband page, again, we put all these links in the chat and they were on that slide. There's that good old subscribe, subscribe button to get to the email newsletter that William sends out about E-rate and we'll include ECF. The ALA's page, um, and I, they have a whole bunch of background, but here's the thing I was really talking about. They have a few that are still coming soon, but here's their laptop, here's their little guides, laptop or tablet lending, long-term hotspot lending. Here's a few more ideas that they'll have coming pretty soon. Um, and these guides are multi-page PDF that give you really the full rundown. And finally, here's the funds for learning. They've got another webinar themselves coming up. And then they have um, a little broad information and then have, they have kind of a nice summary of what the Emergency Connectivity Fund is. 
So I haven't seen any more questions. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Hopefully you learned a little bit about the Emergency Connectivity Fund here and uh, hope you'll consider it and reach out to us certainly uh, if you have any questions. And uh, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Dylan and William. I've learned a ton today all about this, this new service. Um, super exciting. Uh, as, as Dylan mentioned, I just want to do some final housekeeping things. Um, as, you, as this webinar ends, you're going to be prompted to complete a survey, and we are always interested in your honest feedback. And we will also be sending you a link to the recorded version of this webinar in about a week. Um, and coming up next, uh, next Monday, the next InfoTogo webinar is a virtual facilitation that rocks. So it'll be all about beefing up those virtual facilitation skills, and we hope that you'll join us next Monday. Thank you all so much for attending. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>